Our culture and society tell us we are defined by the things we own, the money we collect, our pain and suffering, and our achievements in life. And yet God tells us that our value and worth can be defined by Him. We have been misinformed. Well, good morning, church family. It's an exciting morning. Not only do we have believers baptism coming up in the second service, uh, but we also get to take the Lord's Supper together. So if you did not get elements on your way in, if you would lift your hand, we have some deacons who will pop up and come around and make sure that you have those. Uh, As we move towards the Lord's Supper, if you are a born again baptized believer, you are welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us, okay? The scripture tells us to, uh, to not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So the entire service, as we begin, I just want you to begin to pray that the Lord would convict you and search my heart, see if there is any wicked way in me that needs to be confessed, that we need to repent of. That way, when we get to the Lord's Supper, we are ready and prepared to take it. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, as we begin a new sermon series this morning. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. You can take that Bible as a gift from us to you, and you can make it your own. There's a movie way back in 2000 uh, called Memento, and in it, Leonard Shelby tries to track down his wife's killer. Now, complicating the search is the fact that Leonard took a blow to the head by the murderer, resulting in a severe, very rare form of amnesia, which makes it impossible for him to remember anything new for more than a few minutes. In short, Leonard doesn't know who he is, and he doesn't know what is true anymore. So he develops a complicated system of videos and Polaroid pictures and even tattoos of facts that he thinks can tell him the truth of who he is and remind him when his mind resets of his mission in life. Now, to complicate matters further, there are several shady characters who are trying to manipulate Leonard's condition for their own gain. And as the movie wrestles with concepts of identity and truth, there's one climactic scene where Leonard is confronted by his crooked friend, but his friend says to him, you don't even know who you are anymore. Now, what a haunting place to be. Who am I? And who can I trust to reveal to me the truth of who I am? Now, friend, this morning, the Bible would say that those questions are of the utmost importance to the foundation of all of your life. Who are you? And who can you trust to reveal to you the truth of who you are. So this morning we're starting a new series that we've titled Misinformed, where we're going to walk through what the Bible says about who we are versus how the world constantly tries to define us. So church, when when you see the madness of our culture and confusion, and the messages that are constantly thrown at us, this is probably the most important sermon series I've preached in my entire tenure here. Believe it or not, every day we are believing and operating out of an identity. And whether you know it or not, your belief about who you are gives the foundation for how you think and how you make decisions. It is the soil in which your life grows. Now, sadly, we as Christians are much like Leonard, okay? We have this condition where we are continually forgetting who we are in 
Christ. And further, right, we are incessantly misinformed by the surrounding culture and lied to by our enemy Satan, who, who wishes for us to have any other identity rather than our true one. Believe anything else about yourself other than the fact that you are in Christ. So over the course of the next six weeks, we're going to look and expose identity lies, okay? The lie that if you have enough money, then you will be happy. Or I am what I achieve. We will uncover culture's deception. That is that your desires define you. Or Hollywood's narrative that other people complete you. All of that is coming, but this morning we need to lay a good foundation about who we are in Christ. And we will begin in Genesis chapter 3 and see who God made us to be and then how we lost that identity in the fall and how Satan's tactics have not changed, okay? But the good news and later on, we're, we're going to, uh, near the end of the service, we're going to flip forward in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, okay? And we're going to do that quick, but we're going to see there in Ephesians 1 how we are in Christ, how Jesus came to be our new identity. All right, so we've got a lot to cover this morning, so let's jump in. Genesis 3. Listen to the first five verses. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, as we examine all of our lives from the perspective of what you have said and the way that you frame our reality. Father, I pray that you would teach us, that your spirit would give us wisdom and discernment to understand the tactics and the schemes of the enemy, to understand the deep questions of our heart, the longing of our heart, and to see the magnificent truth of who your son is and the way that he came to redeem and give us a new identity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, now I know what you're thinking after having read Genesis 3, the sophisticated, educated people that you are. All right, how embarrassing. Right, the part of the Bible where we have a talking snake and a forbidden apple, and Adam and Eve are naked. All right, this is a bit of a fairy tale, isn't it, Pastor? Well, friend, the longer that I've studied it and the more that I understand it, this narrative absolutely amazes me at its brilliance, the way that it lays out and frames the human condition, and the questions and the longing of our heart. So this morning, I only have time to do a quick flyover, but I long to compel you too with the story's brilliance. Now, it's important we understand from the two previous chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, all right, that the eternal God alone is the creator of everything. Okay. He simply spoke, and because of his will, everything came into existence. And when he created it, everything was good and perfect according to his character. And the crown of God's creation was man, 
made in his image. He made them male and female in his image. And it was very good. And man walked with God in the cool of the day, in perfect fellowship, in a perfect home, the Garden of Eden. From here, let's pick up in Genesis 3. Because Adam and Eve are in the garden when suddenly the antagonist enters. Now, throughout history, the snake has always mystified humans. How is it that it slithers along the ground? And it has always symbolized evil. So whether here the serpent symbolizes Satan or embodies Satan, we cannot exactly know. And exactly what the communication arrangements were in Eden, we cannot know that either. But what we do know is that Satan, with his first sentence, he begins with a question. What's the harm in asking a question, right? Now, before we go any further, what you must understand is that the most prominent form of spiritual warfare is in the realms of truth and lies. Overwhelmingly, right? Not demonic possession or dark magic. It is a battle over truth. Do you remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights? That battle, it wasn't with swords or brute strength. It was a battle over believing God's word. And then Satan taking and twisting God's word. Truth and lies. In John chapter 8, Jesus' most lengthy uh, teaching on Satan, he calls him the father of lies. Now pause and think about our culture and where we are in truth decay swirling with misinformation and believing a lie that truth now resides in us. That's where our culture is. Now think about this account because as we walk through it, it is paramount that you understand the way Satan operates. So Satan first begins with a question. Again, what's the harm in asking a question, right? Did God really say You must not eat from any tree in the garden. You must see that Satan has interjected the right amount of skepticism with the question itself. This is no benign question. This is the way he operates. On one level, the question is flattering to Adam and Eve. Because it sneaks in the assumption, without actually saying it, that they have the right to sit in judgment of God's word. Did God say that? Adam says, well, well, let me see. Eve, what do you think about what God said? Now, additionally, Satan has exaggerated the prohibition. God had forbidden one tree. Right there, Acres and acres worth of magnificent garden and thousands, maybe millions of fruit trees, and God forbade one. But by exaggeration, Satan is suggesting that God is a legalistic killjoy. How dare he withhold such goodness from you? You see, the lie that is underneath every other lie is that God is not as good or as wise as he claims to be, and he's holding out on you. And if he's holding out on you, you have the right to rebel. In fact, you are better off looking out for yourself. Now, at first, Eve rebukes his exaggeration. No, we we may eat from fruit that's in the trees of the garden. She's on the right track. But God did say about that one tree, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. She has taken the bait for she too exaggerates. God did not say you can't touch it. You see, maybe God is a 
cosmic party pooper who's holding out on us. Now, what should Eve have said here? Or Adam, for that matter, because he's standing right next to her the entire time. What should they have said? Are you crazy? Look around at this place. This place is amazing. And God has made these. He has created paradise for us. There is so much goodness. And we are in perfect fellowship. That's what it means when the scripture says that they were naked and unashamed, that there is no hiding, that there is complete unity and openness together, perfect fellowship. And they walk with God in the coolness of the day, the most intimate, personal way, made in God's image, and they know who they are. And furthermore, they have purpose. But God has commissioned them, told them to fill the earth and subdue it. You see, the garden was cultivated, but the rest of the earth was still wild. There was an adventure that awaited. And they were supposed to fill the earth with God's image and bring his, his image to the entirety, to cultivate, to invent, to go on an adventure. So what they should have said is, get out of here, creep. God is good, and we know exactly who we are. But they don't. They are flattered, and they entertain the skepticism. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Satan, the father of lies, flat out lies. There's no judgment. God will not do what he said he would do. And when you've removed all the consequences, it's now safe to rebel. For God knows that in that day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, the truth is, is that Adam and Eve were already like God, made in his image. And they know who they are. They are over creation and under God's authority. And up to this point, God is the one who has declared everything is good. God is the one who declares good and evil. God made it and he declared that it, it, it was good. And then he set the parameters <clears throat> around that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now it's vital that we pause here and think very well about that tree. <clears throat> Please notice that there's no mention of an apple, as if God hates apples but loves oranges. All right? The tree, by name, represents the one who determines good and evil. See, the temptation here is to step outside of God's authority and declare for ourselves that which is right and wrong. Do you see it? In this way, become like God. You can become the one who declares truth, truth for yourself, whatever your truth is. It's an intoxicating vision to defy him and become at least a rival, if not a flat-out enemy. See, it's not one tiny bite breaking one single rule. It's an invitation to begin a revolution where we become the center of everything. Now, the most effective lies are lies that are covered over in a candy shell of truth. Satan is right. This will open up their eyes to a deeper level of moral consciousness. Later, God says as much. But the vicious lie underneath is that this will mean becoming evil from within. God in his omniscience 
has declared that which is right and wrong because he knows everything in the same way that a doctor knows and operates on a cancer patient. But the patient knows the cancer from within. Through pain and ravaging consequences on the inside. Deceived by partial truth and intoxicated by the prospect of stepping out from underneath this killjoy of a God, right? Wouldn't it be nice to throw him off? Adam and Eve each took a bite. Stepping out from God and into spiritual death. Their eyes were open. But now they hide in shame because the evil is within. In just a few moments, Adam will be blaming God and Eve, and then Eve will be blaming the serpent. Discord abounds where harmony and trust once flowed. Within a chapter, we have the first cold-blooded murder. And within a few more, the world has become so corrupt that God will bring judgment, wiping out almost all with a flood. Furthermore, Adam is hiding from God too. Sin has separated. He no longer walks with God in the cool of the garden. And man no longer knows who he is. Paradise lost and identity lost, naked and ashamed, needing to cover up and compensate. That's the perfect picture for man's new reality of what it meant to step outside of God's authority into this distorted new reality. How desperately insufficient we are in ourselves. Let me repeat that, how desperately insufficient we are in ourselves. Who am I? Am I enough? Am I pretty enough and smart enough? When will I be happy? Where are you, contentment and peace? Is there someone or something to complete me? Does my life have any real meaning? And even now in 2024, with all of our riches and all of our convenience and all of our progress, the questions of the heart only grow louder. How desperately insufficient we are in ourselves. But God... But God so loved mankind that he gave his one and only son. Think with me of the titles that are given to Jesus, right? The Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Adam, the last Adam. Do you know that the New Testament calls Jesus the second Adam or the last Adam? That is because Jesus came to undo and to redeem everything lost and destroyed by the first Adam. A quote from one author, the first Adam turned from God, from the Father in the garden. The last Adam turned to the Father in a garden. The first Adam was naked and unashamed. The last Adam was naked and bore our shame. The first Adam's sin brought us thorns The last Adam wore a crown of thorns. The first Adam substituted himself for God. The last Adam was God substituting himself for sinners. The first Adam sinned on a tree. The last Adam bore our sins on a tree. The first Adam died as a sinner. The last Adam died for sinners. Beloved, over the past eight weeks, we walk through, leading up to Easter, Jesus' agony 
and victory that was accomplished on the cross. And we looked intently at his atonement for our sins. And praise God, we say hallelujah, Jesus is our Savior. But beloved, it is imperative you also know that Jesus is our new identity. Our new identity. So flip forward in Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> flip to Ephesians chapter 1. Now for the next seven minutes or so, all right, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose. I'm going to blast you. It's going to be overwhelming <clears throat> because I'm going to overview the first three chapters of Ephesians. You're not going to be able to comprehend it all. It's okay. Don't worry. But what I want you to understand, I want to make one singular point. That is that the New Testament screams that Jesus is your new identity. And that is so fundamental to everything about understanding who you are. So Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gives an intro in the first two verses, and then in verse 3, <clears throat> verses 3 through 14 is one long sentence in the Greek, all right? You couldn't write that way in high school. I can't write that. Uh, Paul can. He gets to. One sentence in the Greek, 3 through 14, and the summary, that first sentence is that <clears throat> because you are now in Christ, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and there is a movement that undergoes. I'm about to tell you what six things he lists, but there's a movement that goes there. And that is that God the Father is the great mover. And God has picked you up and placed you in Christ so that you would explode with praise of his glorious grace. And after he lists a promise, then he says, basically, God did this put you in Christ so that you would explode with praise because he is so good, okay? That you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. God the Father put you in Christ. In fact, 11 times through this one sentence, it says that you are in him, that you are in Christ. And then he lists promises that flow from being in him. So the first promise, he says that you have been chosen from the foundation of the world, that God knew who you were and he chose you and he placed you in Christ, that you will stand before God holy and blameless, chosen. Second one, he says you have been adopted in him. That in Christ, you are a son or a daughter of, he calls you his own. He calls you his own. Next, it says that he has redeemed you, okay? That is, he purchased you with his blood so that your sins are completely forgiven because they have been paid in full. In Christ, your sins have been washed away. Fourthly, he says that he has revealed his will to you. That is that you, you are no longer a slave. He, he calls you friend. You now, your mind gets renewed with, with the thoughts and the promises of God and you can, you can begin to chase and follow after him. Fifthly, he says that you have obtained an inheritance that's waiting for you in heaven. It will not fade away. It will not perish. It is eternal, an eternal inheritance. You have every promise, every reward that awaits you. And then sixthly, he says, on top of that, you have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That is that you are his own. You cannot lose it. He has gifted that to you. You are his own in Christ and his presence dwells in you, okay? You have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Then Paul moves on and he begins to pray for the Ephesians. And he has a prayer. It's a lengthy, full of lots of theology sort of prayer. But if you look at it in verse 17, you can see the contents of exactly what he's praying for. And he prays that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. In other words, that you would begin to have 
spiritual eyes to see and to know who God is. Because if you could really see and understand who God is, then you would know the hope of his calling and the riches of his inheritance and the power that is available to you because you are in Christ Jesus. Remember, everything is because you've been picked up and placed in Christ Jesus. And then Paul explodes with a doxology. That is this giant praise of God that says, if you could only see where Jesus is now. If you could see that he is ascended, that he is risen, that he is ruling and reigning above Every spiritual authority in the heavenly places. He is seated above it all. And he has been given as head to the church. Okay, all of that. That's just chapter one. So don't tire out on me now, all right? Because then he says, all right, if you could see where Jesus was. But now listen, he begins chapter two. He says, listen, you used to be dead. But you've been resurrected with Christ. He made you alive. And he seated you with him in the heavenly places. That is right now. This is verse 6 of chapter 2. Right now in the spiritual sense, because you are in Christ, you have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Oh, if you could only see where Christ is. And then if you could only understand where you are. And then there's this overflow that God has works for you that you will just walk out in. You don't have to do anything, but just walk in the goodness of what God has already prepared. All of that in your individual identity. And then he moves on into your corporate identity when he talks about the fact that we used to be uh, separated by race and class and all of those things, but he's made us all into one new man. And he's building us up into the temple of God. Okay? That is when we gather together as the church God's the Holy Spirit indwells us. And when we gather together, we are a living temple of God. And then in chapter three, Paul continues and he says, listen, the mission that I have to go and to preach the good news of the kingdom, the mission that the church has to go to the ends of the earth to tell anyone and everyone And that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord because of the gospel and the authorities in the heavenly places that will see how God has taken the church, that is you and I, and redeemed us and placed us in Christ over and above and that that we will be the image bearers that spread to the entirety of the earth and that God's plan will complete. That all of that, we, we shouldn't count any of our sufferings, right? That's nothing in comparison to the mission So think about this. In the first three chapters, Paul has articulated, remember, everything that was lost by Adam. We did not know who we are. And there was was disharmony between us. And and, and we had lost our mission. We no longer, we, we were confused about all of those things. And then he says, listen, God has placed you in Christ, in Christ. And then he overflows that all of those things that were undone have now been redone. And they're better and they're greater. And you have all the promises of God. Okay, that's the whole first three chapters of Ephesians. And then Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, therefore, now walk worthy. Now walk worthy. And then the rest of the book, he will begin to give practical commands of obedience. Hey, stop doing that. We don't do that. You're a Christian. We don't do that. But listen, all of this flows out of your identity. The identity truth first. Friend, you must understand the deepest questions and longings of your heart are about your identity in Christ. And the mass confusion of our culture is they don't know, man doesn't know who he is. He's thoroughly confused. That's why there's confusion. Growing up, I always dreamed of being a Division I soccer player. And that was my identity. 
I was good at athletics. I was a good athlete. Or at least I thought I was. I mean, the older you get, you're like, I ah, probably wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was, right? Well, my senior year, that dream came into question. And when it did, this gigantic fear began to rise up in my heart. What if I'm not good enough? What if I'm not good enough? So I completely walked away. Now, I can tell you that with clarity now. But at the time, it, it was all pride. That's all you would get. At the beginning of my senior year, uh, I was benched for the first half of a soccer game. It was the first time I had ever not started a soccer game in my entire career. Well, you don't bench Jason Smith. And so at halftime, I walked to the parking lot and never returned. But the heart always goes from one idol to another. And so my senior year, I really latched on to friends, and there was a girl. It wasn't my wife, if you're thinking. Later in the series, we're going to be talking about uh, finding your identity in other people and the struggle that that causes. But at the time, I was in love, and I was going to marry this girl. But she crumbled under the weight of having to be my lifesaver. And before long, I was a freshman at A&M, and I was away from my parents. I was away from all of my high school friends. I was no longer an athlete, and this girl didn't want anything to do with me. And my whole world was shaken. And there was a giant spotlight on this one fact that I didn't know who I was. That everything I'd previously built my life upon crumbled. And there in the depths of the most vulnerable spot I'd ever been in my life, the Holy Spirit began to take God's word and speak it deep into the depth of my soul. That is, Jason, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. It's the only foundation you can ever walk and live and be stable in Christ. Amen. Beloved, prepare the bread first. As we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could become his righteousness, his perfection. Hold the elements. I'm going to give you just a few moments. If the Spirit of God has stirred in your heart in any way this morning, reminding you of some sins that need to be confessed, that need to just be laid down again at the foot of the cross. Remember, we don't want to take this in an unworthy manner. So I'm going to give you just a few moments to do business with the Lord, and then we will take this together as a family.
And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he gave this to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to prepare the cup. And I want you to remember that with his new covenant, beloved, he made you new. He made you new. He came to be your identity so that you would walk out in the freedom and the confidence in his assurance, in his strength, in his power to remember you've been seated with him in the heavenly places. You are in Christ. So I want you to celebrate that in your mind and in your heart. The victory, the magnificence that you know who you are. You are in Christ. I'm going to give you just a few moments for you to celebrate that with your Lord. Then we'll take this together. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, you are so good. You are so kind, you are so everything. You are our righteousness. You are our goodnesses. You, you fill us with promises. Father, we celebrate that this morning, that you, the great mover, have placed us in Christ to the praise of your glorious grace. That is what you long for from us, that we would shout back a hallelujah. Hallelujah that we would take hold of who we are in Christ, that we would have a confidence, an assurance, a belief, a trust that Jesus is enough for us to walk out in victory and that each of us knows who we are in in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, the praise team is going to come lead us in one final song. It's a chance for us to respond. You've responded in partaking of the Lord's Supper. This is an opportunity for you to stand and sing in faith, to shout hallelujah, to the praise of his glorious grace. If you know that you are in Christ this morning and that he is good, that he has overflowed you with his graciousness, then you are invited to stand and sing in faith. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you if you came in with a burden, if you need someone to talk to. Please, please, please do not hesitate. Respond to the Lord in obedience, however the Spirit is calling you. Would you stand?